Good afternoon. Uh, hi. Uh, I hope you're all doing well. We are getting uh, close to 50 degrees here in Washington. So, and it's sunny. It's been sunny for a while. I know that's very different than what's been happening in Los Angeles and other parts of California. But welcome to all of you as we do uh, another reflection on the Eucharist with reference to evangelization. As uh, I'm sure most of you know, the American bishops have set aside a time for Eucharistic revival and renewal. And this will come to a climax in July of 2024 in Indianapolis. Uh, I've been involved in uh, certain aspects of this revival, and I've been thinking a lot about the Eucharist and uh, the celebration of the Eucharist and the context in which we celebrate it. And that's why I would like to um, present a way to look at our Eucharist from the point of view of conversion, discipleship, and evangelization. So let me find my uh, presentation here, share my screen. There it is right there. Things are moving a little slower today than usual. So let me uh, get this going. There we are. So uh, we're going to be talking about worship and transformation. I invite you to, I don't know why my, my screen is jumping around. I invite you to uh, uh, join with me in this prayer, which I composed as part of the renewals I've been doing around the Eucharist. Lord God of infinite love, you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to enter our lives, save us, and transform us through your Holy Spirit. Your son gave us the Eucharist to continue touching and transforming our lives. At Mass, we celebrate God's word. At Mass, we unite ourselves with Jesus, our priest, who gives you unending praise. At Mass, the Holy Spirit comes upon us to make us Christ's living mystical body. We pray that our desire to deepen our understanding of the great gift of the Eucharist might help us to grow as disciples, see Christ's presence in our families and our parish, and empower us to bring Christ Jesus every day into the world. We pray this in his name. Amen. Uh, just a little orientation before we get underway. Um, you can uh, ask uh, questions and answers, which we'll deal with at the end of the uh, uh, the presentation today. So down uh, when your menu appears, if you see Q&A, you can write any questions there. Uh, the chat sometimes is a little iffy to use with webinars, so I encourage you to uh, use the Q&A, and we'll deal with those as we come to an end. So we have a basic gospel, and that gospel uh, can be uh, called the Paschal Mystery. And it's very central. Uh, we are all about the death and the resurrection of Jesus. And it's very helpful to remember that the Mass is as much a celebration of Jesus' resurrection as it is a celebration of his death. Uh, many of us are still focused on the idea of the Mass is primarily the unbloody sacrifice, but it is also the uh, transformed bodily resurrection of Jesus, which is present. And how we participate in the death and the resurrection of Jesus is, in fact, the story of our spiritual lives. In some way, we are all called to die and to rise multiple times in our lives. And this experience of dying and rising is accomplished in us by the Holy Spirit, that the risen Jesus sends his Holy Spirit upon us and brings about the reality of the Paschal mystery inside of us. And the Paschal mystery is something that is central to the lives of all of us as Christians and as Catholics. It is the death and the resurrection of Jesus, 
all ministry is really a way to help people experience death and resurrection and participate in that Paschal mystery. All of us baptized people take part in this process, whether we're conscious of it or not. And conversion is the way in which you and I appropriate the Paschal mystery in our lives. That's why for us Catholics, conversion is not one thing, one moment, one event that happens in our lives, a part of the daily experience of our lives. And that is why the Eucharist has a big role to play in our lives as people experiencing conversion in different ways as we respond to Christ. So all the sacraments are celebrating an aspect of Jesus' death and resurrection. They all point to a dying and a rising that's happening in our daily life. And when we minister to people, we are helping them uncover the mystery of Jesus in their daily lives. Uh, just as an example, those of us who have been privileged to minister in the OCIA, the way in which we invite adults to become part of our church, we see this dimension of conversion happening in their lives as they deepen their relationship with Jesus and come to a point where they commit themselves and celebrate that commitment in the sacrament of baptism. But all the sacraments are really talking about death and resurrection. Baptism gives us the basic pattern because it's the first of the sacraments. And we remember that uh, on the, at the Easter Vigil, when we're celebrating the baptisms of people, we read from Romans chapter 6, do you not know that when we were baptized, we died with Christ? And because we died with Christ, we are now living a new life. That is the basic pattern of all spirituality, of all holiness, of all conversion. And obviously the sacrament of penance, or better, the celebration of reconciliation, is an experience of reconversion on different levels in our lives as we have experienced isolation from Christ and from others. But marriage is also a way to engage death and resurrection. I think married couples probably can testify to this pretty readily. And it is their commitment to live discipleship together, the husband and the wife loving each other in the pattern of Christ or deepening their discipleship of service to each other, to their families, but also to the people of God. Healing, uh, any of us who have been privileged to celebrate the sacrament of healing, of, of anointing, uh, the trust that we are invoking people to have, very similar to the cross, uh, trust of Christ Jesus on the cross. Father, into your hands, I commend my spirit. Confirmation is our commitment to discipleship, probably at a more conscious part of our lives for many of us. And orders is a specific ministerial sacramental commitment. Deacons, priests, bishops, testify by their own lives that they are dedicated to celebrating the sacraments and the meaning of the sacraments on behalf of other people as part of their way of life. And then what we'll be exploring today, the Eucharist as identity with Jesus in his death and his resurrection. So uh, we keep in mind that the heart of our proclamation is also the heart of our Christian experience dying and rising in Christ. And this is captured so well at the end of the prayer that people attribute to St. Francis. It is in dying that we are raised. It is in giving that we receive. It is in dying that we are born to eternal life. So what is the Mass? The Mass is an interactive experience. We guide people in a process of call and response. The purpose of the Mass is identity with the whole Christ in his death and resurrection, Christ in his risen person, Christ in the community of the people in which he dwells. The whole Mass is the work of the Holy Spirit in us today. We Catholics have a very Christocentric idea of the Mass, 
that we are being united with Christ, but we also have to remember that this is also an experience that Christ brings about through the Holy Spirit, an interactive experience. So everybody who is at the Eucharist is celebrating the Eucharist. This is very clear in the documents of the Second Vatican Council. And we show that we together are celebrating the Eucharist by the way we interact with each other as part of the patterns of the Eucharist. Now, the orientation, I think, uh, which is wonderful for the Mass, is the story of Emmaus, because we have these two people, Cleopas and Cleopas's companion, leaving Jerusalem on Sunday, the earliest they can after the Sabbath, and Jesus begins walking alongside them, although they do not know that. And as he walks alongside them, he begins to give them a perspective on the Hebrew scriptures. Was it not necessary that the Son of Man should die in view of all that we see in the Hebrew scriptures? And then as they get to Emmaus, Jesus looks like he's going to go forward further. And they say, no, stay with us, stay with us. And Jesus stays with them. And it was, is when the bread is broken, when he blesses the bread, breaks it, and gives it to those disciples, that they realize that they have been walking with the risen Christ all along. And so this shows that from the various earliest conceptions of the Mass, the liturgy of the word, that is a celebration of the word, and the liturgy of the table, which we uh, call the liturgy of the Eucharist in a more specific sense, these are two dimensions of the Mass, and they are intimately connected with each other. The Liturgy of the Word and the Liturgy of the Eucharist are inherent parts of the Eucharist. Each part reflects on the importance of the other part. Each part calls us to conversion or reaffirms our experience of conversion. And I know for uh, you know many, many centuries, uh, the Liturgy of the Word was something that we said in Latin, and we certainly didn't proclaim out loud to the congregation. And many people sometimes felt if they got to the Mass by the offertory, then they had enough of the Mass. But Vatican II has really helped recover the essential dimensions of the Mass and put them into a proportion, which is very central for our understanding of conversion the proportion between the Liturgy of the Word and the Liturgy of the Eucharist. And most of the time when uh, the Eucharist is celebrated on Sundays in parishes, uh, as much time is spent on the Liturgy of the Word as on the Liturgy of the Eucharist. And so the proportion is a way to see that these two dimensions are inherently connected to each other. So here's a definition for you. The Eucharist is an interactive experience that is fundamentally evangelizing. We call people to conversion. We celebrate commitment. We renew commitment. And then we send people forth. Now, this is a slant on the Eucharist that probably a lot of people don't have on their minds. And yet, I think at this time of Eucharistic revival, it is very helpful for us to show people how the Eucharist is part of a life of discipleship, a life of ongoing conversion and commitment. And the Eucharist is effecting this as part of the very way that we celebrate it. So an interactive experience, a pattern of call and response. So throughout the mass, the Lord be with you and with your spirit, let us pray. The people answer amen, um, the whole uh, beginning of the, uh, the, the preface, uh, the Lord be with you, lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. We are together as one congregation. The word is calling us, and we as a people are responding. The people respond at different times and at different ways throughout the Eucharist, and each response is showing a deeper aspect of discipleship. So I would like us to think of the Mass as kind of the way 
um, some religious groups think of their um, their celebration or when they get together, their word service, as a way in which people are being called to conversion and their coming together enables them to respond. So the word of God, which we have, uh, again, reformed by Vatican II, in the first reading presents the context of Jesus in the Hebrew scriptures. So we read from the Hebrew scriptures, but we read from the Hebrew scriptures to reflect on the meaning of Christ. It presents a response to the proclamation in the psalm. The psalm is the community already beginning to say, um, yes, Lord, I will follow you. Uh, Lord, you have uh, freed me. Lord, you are my savior, whatever the psalm happens to be. And then the second reading on Sunday is invariably a reading from the experience of the earliest Christians. Uh, after Easter, of course, it's from the Acts of the Apostles. Many Sunday Sundays, it's from the writings of St. Paul. And then we have the writings of Peter and, and the others. These are the people who first followed Christ. And so we are hearing what it means to follow Christ in the experience of those people who heard the gospel within the first 50 or 60 years of, of Christian experience. And then, of course, the gospel, we stand for that because we consider the gospel Christ speaking to us again today. So the whole liturgy of the word is designed to present a set of images, a set of, of words, of references, a set of ideas, if you will, that would enable us to engage with Christ and respond to Christ. So the scriptures have a power in themselves. They evoke the imagination and the responses of the congregation. During these uh, weeks, uh, in the past few weeks, we have basically been reading from the beginning of the uh, Gospel of Mark. The initial proclamation, uh, the kingdom of God is right here for you, right at hand. Be converted, open your eyes, open your heart so you can see it. And then this almost frenetic action of Jesus as he goes and calls disciples together and begins to engage with various people in need and shows the coming of the kingdom of God when he heals the blind, when he heals the leper, when he heals people with all their illnesses, etc. So as people are hearing this, they are being formed in the mind of Christ. We are learning a vocabulary, which is the vocabulary of the scriptures. And as we hear that word, we realize it is calling us to conversion. So when the leper comes up and says to Jesus, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus says, of course I will. That's an invitation for us to think of the ways in which we need to be healed, in which parts of us need to be clarified, in which parts of our lives need to be purified. And that's an invitation for us to experience Christ healing us today and experiencing Christ healing us today, helping us understand how we are called to conversion and to be people who are disciples. Now, when we proclaim the scriptures, we are proclaiming the spiritual meaning. And what, what does that mean? You know, so the scriptures, obviously they have history and obviously they have poetry and obviously they have uh, various levels of language, all these different genres. But the Bible is not primarily a book of history. It certainly is not primarily a book of science or anything. The Bible is a book about God's relationship to us, and therefore, what is our relationship to God? And because of that, what is our relationship to each other? The texts are inviting us into the kingdom of God. The texts are calling us to a form of death and resurrection. So the whole experience of, of being healed is an experience of dying and rising because we come to God in our brokenness. And in that brokenness, God gives us the life of Christ as our healing. 
And uh, so again and again in our lives, everything is, is about how we are called to conversion. And uh, a liturgy is evangelizing when it is calling people to conversion or calling people to reconversion. It is evangelizing when it invites people to renew their experience of death and resurrection in union with Christ. It is evangelizing when it brings people to a decisive question and asks for a response. And that is particularly uh, the function of the homily, which is the hinge between the liturgy of the word and the liturgy of the table. Now that we have heard this gospel, how is it calling us to live, to live in a new way, to understand a new relationship with Christ? And how is that happening in the way that word is coming to us? So as the word is spoken to us, will we hear that word? Will we let it challenge us? Will we let it call us to conversion? Will we respond? And of course, that is exactly what we're doing throughout the rest of the mass. The liturgy of the word is asking us if we will be disciples and the liturgy of the Eucharist, the liturgy of the table, is the way in which we respond. So there are five distinct responses to the word of God that move us more fully into the experience of conversion and commitment. And it is these responses that I think we have to help Catholics realize a part of their becoming disciples and their experiencing conversion in their lives. So the first response to the word of God is the recitation of the creed. You have heard God's word. Having heard God's word, what do you say? And the first thing we say is, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in God, the, uh, uh, the, the, the creator of all things visible and invisible. Whatever creed we're saying, each of those creeds is a way to summarize our sense of having a profound belief in Christ and the Holy Spirit and therefore in the Father. Now, you know, there's a, was a, a time when many uh, evangelicals would look at others and they'd say, have you accepted Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? And we Catholics would kind of look around at ourselves and say, well, I think I did, but when did I do that? When did we do this every time we worship. We do this every time we proclaim the creed. We are saying that God is the center of our lives, that we accept his son Jesus, that we want to dwell in the Holy Spirit, and that this is the, the core of who we are. So we believe in Jesus as Savior of the world, his, him, the Son of the Father, the one who sends the Holy Spirit upon us. Our Christian life springs from our faith. And that faith is what we have proclaimed in the Word of God, and now we are accepting the Word of God. So we need to think about this because those creeds are a lot of words, and it's not part of our modern culture to recite 300 words or 400 words together. Uh, you know, people tend to say them automatically or their minds drift in and out. But we have to help people realize that they are involved in a fundamental act of trust and acceptance. And that is what the creed expresses. How do we make that clear to people? How do we help them realize we are saying, yes, Lord, I believe, I accept. Now, today, more of us are saying the Apostles' Creed, which is slightly more digestible than Nicene Creed. Sometimes, uh, and, and the, uh, the uh, general instruction for the Roman Missal suggests this, we can do this by having people alternate sides of the church. And then, of course, during Easter, we have people renew their baptism promises, which is probably the clearest, clearest expression of conversion that they get to, to proclaim. Do you believe in God? I do. Do you believe in his son, Jesus? I do. Do you believe in the Holy Spirit? I do. 
and and this faith of Catholics needs to be palpable to us that th this is this is who we are and this is what permeates our whole lives and this is what we're celebrating in the mass now in addition to I believe the next spots next response we have is in the offertory and the offertory says because I have heard the word of God I give myself we give ourselves in response to that word. We give the fruit of the earth. We give the fruit of the vine, gifts from God, but we also give the work of our hands, our own efforts, our own energy, our own time, our own sweat. So having heard the word of God, will you roll up your sleeves and live this word? And the offertory is saying, yes, I will. So the offertory is the gift of our being, our resources, who we are, in response to the love of God who gives us everything. We, in this part of the Mass, are asking Catholics to give themselves. I know the emphasis is primarily on money. It wasn't that way necessarily in the early church because people used to bring forth gifts that would be used by the leaders of the church to care for the poor throughout the week, food and even animals, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, modern people, we don't come to church with little chickens or what have you. And so there is a focus on money and there is a focus on what we give, but that focus on money has to be enlarged in the minds of people. When I give my money, I'm not opening my wallet and deciding, oh, I'll throw a few bucks in the basket. I am opening my heart and saying, Lord, I have heard your word and I want to be part of it. I want to give myself to the kingdom. I want to give myself to the good news that I have heard. And so just as God called Abraham, Moses, Jeremiah, Esther, Judith, the apostles, Peter and Paul. So God is calling us. And as they responded by saying, yes, they would give their lives. So we are responding by saying we are giving our lives. And we show that by the giving of our gifts. Now, the giving of our gifts is not primarily the uh, financial needs of the local parish. Oh, we hear that uh, a lot. So we're not just giving money to the parish for the upkeep. And, you know, pastors will say the roof is leaking. We need contributions or the rug needs to be clean. We need contributions, et cetera. We give to the parish because the parish is an embodiment of the kingdom of God. That what was proclaimed in the gospel is what the parish pledges itself to live. And the parish is making the kingdom of God visible here in our midst. And I think we cheat people by focusing exclusively uh, or primarily our language is about money and about the quantity of money. And we need to expand this to say, how are you giving? How are you participating in the kingdom of God with your life, with your resources, with your energy, with your gifts? Now, then we have the third response, and that is the whole Eucharistic prayer. And I'd like us to think of the whole Eucharistic prayer as one entire prayer, from the preface all the way to the doxology at the end. It is one prayer in which we are primarily giving thanks to God. So we all pray the Eucharistic prayer, uh, the priest says, the Lord be with you and with your spirit. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks. We give thanks to the Lord. And everything we say after that is our way of thanking the Lord for what he has done for us in Christ Jesus. So it's a remembrance and a reenacting of the gift of Christ himself in the Eucharist. Our gifts are consecrated, and we as givers of the gifts are consecrated. And the doxology at the end of the Eucharistic prayer 
is, I submit, the highlight of the Eucharist. The great amen in response to the doxology sums up the aims of stewardship and discipleship. So think of this prayer just for a moment. And this is in every preface that we say comes to its climax. Through him, with him, and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. This is the height of stewardship, and this is the goal of all evangelization. And this is part of the song that creation will be singing endlessly to God in endless thanksgiving when the kingdom comes in its fullness, because the nature of creation, having received our being, is to turn and open our hearts and to thank the Father. And so when we get to this part of the Mass, uh, people should be realizing that these are the words that they are saying in response to the liturgy of the word that they have heard. We have heard what God has done. We have heard how Christ has come. We have heard how we have been saved through him, with him, in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. Now, as part of the giving thanks, we recall what God did for us in Christ Jesus and what he did on the Last Supper. That is one of the things that we mention for which we are giving thanks, and it is the principal thing for which we are giving thanks. And as we remember what Christ did at the Last Supper, we Catholics believe that Christ is truly present, that he comes to us in the substance of his risen being and his risen life, that the bread which we consecrate becomes his body, the cup becomes his blood. And we even have to stretch our language with words like transubstantiation to try and get at the reality of Christ being present in us and with us through the gifts that we present. Christ comes, unite himself with us. We unite ourselves to Christ. And therefore, we are brought into his perfect act of worship, which was the giving of himself. Uh, on Calvary, the give him, giving of himself in, uh, through death and into resurrection. So th these come together for us, the, the coming together of uh, thanksgiving of God and our unity with Christ, which allows us to thank God. And so the Eucharist, uh, the, 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 this part of the liturgy, identifies us with Christ. Now, here are some of the things that we say in some of the Eucharistic prayers. Grant that we may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make us, the people, an eternal offering to you. Accept us also together with your son. Grant to all who partake of this one body, one bread and one chalice, that gathered into one body by the Holy Spirit, we may become a living sacrifice in Christ. So as Christ gives himself, we give ourselves. As Christ praises the Father, so we praise the Father. As Christ shows what it means to trust unfailingly in the Father, so we trust unfailingly in the Father with Christ Jesus. As Christ lives and is empowered by the Holy Spirit, so we too live and are empowered by the Holy Spirit. And that sense of identity with Christ is really represented in this fourth response, which is the reception of communion. It's a response to the word of God because communion is saying, I want to become Christ's body. I want to live Christ's love. Having heard the word of God, we say, I believe. We say, I give myself. We say praise and thanks to the Father. We say we are one with Christ Jesus, and we receive him in the Eucharist. And this communion is more than a passive receiving of the body of Christ. You know, we have these songs, the sweet Jesus come to me, 
oh Lord, I am not worthy that you should come to me, etc. Christ is coming to me, but just as importantly, we are going to Christ. We are coming forth in communion and making a commitment by asking Christ to come in the most dramatic way we can envision, asking Christ to become part of our lives. So communion is a commitment to become the body of Christ on the part of the congregation and on the part of each individual disciple. Will I take to myself the body of Jesus? Will I take his cup to my lips? I mean, think of what it means when the Eucharistic minister uh, holds up the uh, consecrated bread and says the body of Christ, and we receive it. Is that not saying I want Christ's body to be my body? Is not that Christ asking us, will we make our body part of his body? The blood, which we know for the Jewish people, was the very essence of life. To receive Christ's blood is to be receiving his living vitality inside of us. I want his blood to flow in my veins. I want his life to be my life. So this is a very, very radical expression of discipleship and conversion. And it flows from all the other parts of the Mass. And I, th I think to highlight for Catholics just what kind of statement we are making by going to Holy Communion is a very important thing uh, in our Eucharistic renewal. Will I live Christ's death so I can live his life? Will I live his life in the world? And then communion is our way of accepting the challenge of Jesus to take up our cross every day so that we can be his disciples, to have his attitude of giving himself to the Father the same as our attitude. And then the fifth response is, of course, our dismissal. At the end of Mass, our dismissal, will I go forth from this church as a disciple of Jesus? Now, some of us are called to be monks and kind of stay inside church, if you will, or stay inside the monastic compound and to live our life there. But most of us are called to be out in the world. Jesus celebrates with his disciples, then he sends them forth. He doesn't send them forth to hide themselves. He doesn't send them forth to kind of go into endless contemplation. He sends them forth to make disciples of other people. And so this response to the word of God is saying, I will live my faith in the world. We are accepting the fundamental idea of mission, which is at the heart of discipleship. So one of our words for mass it comes from the Latin word misa. And the Latin word misa was a part of a sentence. Uh, the congregation is sent. Misa means sent. Go, the mass is ended. You are now sent into the world. You are sent to bring Christ and to be Christ in the world. So this dismissal is our commitment to live out the meaning of the Mass throughout the week as disciples with our families, our work environment, our friends, our civic life, to be Christ in the world. Remember, Christianity is based on the Incarnation. The Son of God takes on our human flesh. He doesn't take on our human flesh to deny that flesh. He doesn't enter into our world to deny that world but he comes to transform and to save it. So we are sent to build the kingdom of God in the world today. Now, when a priest is, is uh, ordained, they often say, celebrate this mass as if it was your first and your last, etc." I think this should be in the hearts of everybody who's at the mass. Everybody who is at church should be celebrating this mass as if it was the first mass we experienced as if it was the last mass we experienced, as if it was the only mass we were gonna celebrate in our lives. We have a huge problem 
of the kind of automatic pilot mass. The bells ring, 10 o'clock, the mass starts, and we go through all of our routines, and we're looking at our watches, and kind of uh, uh, 11, uh, 1045 was saying, well, you know, the mass is taking longer, shorter, what have you. And, and we go through a routine often without seeing the emotional, uh, intellectual, and personal commitment that's involved. And uh, this, is, this is really robbing the mass of its energy. If we celebrated the mass with its true dimensions of conversion, our masses would be that much more intense and that much more powerful and that much clearer to us. The Eucharist is not about fulfilling an obligation. It's the privilege of showing our discipleship and our conversion through the way that we worship God the Father through Jesus in the Holy Spirit. And, uh, you know, some of the older ones among us, we were all raised with this. You have to go to Mass on Sunday. The younger generations don't have that in their heads for one reason or another. And maybe they can be a model for us that when we're going to Mass, it's not because we're threatened or because we have to or well, there's going to be some dire consequence if we don't. We go to Mass to express who we are and to renew our sense of conversion. And so our own intensity and involvement in the Mass is a big part of the celebration. If we're all in the back of the church and we're all being blasé and we spend the Mass reading the bulletin, etc., we are affecting how the Mass is being celebrated and we are affecting our own ability to experience the power of the mass. Our own expressiveness is calling others to express themselves. So the pace and the tone of the mass and different ones of us have different liturgical styles to be sure, but all of our styles should have an intensity and an energy that is showing the reality of death and resurrection of salvation that's happening the clarity with which we call people at Mass to pray, to recite, to come forward, to be part of the different parts of the Mass only adds to the power of that celebration. So the Mass obviously has elements to it. The first one is the gathering. And the gathering in the Mass is saying, how are we welcoming people? How are we gathering people? How are we reaching out to people so that they will be part of this community. How are we helping the congregation to hear the word of God and to express themselves in song? How are we challenging people to pay attention to the liturgy that we're doing to our worship and not to ourselves? The Mass is not about the priest. The Mass is about our worship. And, and that's true. The priest's job is not to call attention to himself. But that's true of everybody. Uh, none of the ministers are there to call attention to themselves. We're all there to point to the central act of worship. How are we making the Mass an experience for people? That is to say, and how does it have a clarity and an intensity and a sense of purpose that are really clear in the lives of people. At every mass, there are seekers. There are people thinking about returning to church. There are people who are grieving. There are people who are starving uh, spiritually in a variety of ways. There are people from groups that tend to be on the edge of involvement in church, young adults, parents, etc. How are we speaking to these people how are we helping them become involved in the Mass? How is our community drawing seekers and people who are searching and giving them an answer to their life? So how does our way of celebrating the Eucharist make clear the invitation, challenge, and nourishment that people need to experience death and resurrection? How is conversion highlighted and celebrated at our Masses? And how do we welcoming relational sense among the people of God. And so there's my contact information. Um, the uh, PEMDC 
is the uh, website for our organization, Post Evangelization Ministries. This is my personal website, and I put up different articles. And each week I put up uh, a reflection for uh, thinking about the homily. So you're welcome to go there and check that out whenever, whenever you want. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. And I'm going to see if there are any questions or, or comments that people would want to make before we, we close out this session. I thank you very much for your participation and for uh, listening to and, and hopefully considering some of the ideas that I put forth. So if there's any questions or comments people want to make, uh, move, your, move your mouse across your screen or touch your phone. And there's Q&A down at the bottom. And you can type uh, questions or comments or ideas, anything that was uh, provocative or particularly interesting to you or anything of that sort. I welcome you to do that now. I'll give you a moment to, uh, to think about that. Okay, here's the first one here. Uh, thank you for making this available. Suggestions for sharing with our parish community. Um, yeah, so I, I will send you uh, the, uh, uh, the video. And I say maybe this is a video you might share with your liturgy committee. I will also send you uh, the slides and maybe you can use these slides in talking to other people. I mean, it, it's uh, nothing I said here is all that theologically complicated. But it's just a, a kind of a way to look at stuff that kind of turns on the light bulb. Um, Teresa, uh, thank you for responding to the ideas uh, at the very end to make sure that we are addressing everyone uh, at each mass. Uh, good points to think about. Yes, uh, the, ma the mass is not, Teresa, uh, something that we do for the in-group. The mass is a proclamation of salvation for the world. We have to remember again and again, when Jesus says the blood that is shed for you and for all, that always present in the mass is an orientation to who's not there and how we can, how can we respond to them. Will this recording be available? Yes, uh, uh, Father Bob, it certainly will be available and uh, you'll get that uh, as soon as I get it and I can get your emails. Okay, thank you. And uh, can this video be sent to all who attend? Yes, it will be sent to all who attend. And uh, and you can uh, share the link as you want, Rosemary, with people in your parish. Um, you know, it might be uh, uh, something good to do before Lent begins, just to kind of rethink what we're doing. Um, thank you, uh, Father Gary, for your comments. I'm glad it was enriching to you as a priest. I have to say that, you know, obviously my work is evangelization, uh, but as I grow more deeply into the questions of evangelization, so the issues of discipleship and the issues of conversion are always at the top of my life. And as these have become dominant in my life, it really affects uh, what, I'm, what I'm doing when I celebrate the Eucharist. I see myself coming out and asking people, to be involved in a community that is celebrating its conversion and celebrating the power of the Holy Spirit. So thank you all. I think, uh, do I have any more? Um, I think I've done all the questions here. Yes, so with that, I'm gonna close the video and then um, we will uh, we'll, we'll end with this uh, little glory be to the Father and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen.